Okay, well, um, I think we'll begin. So uh, I'd like to welcome you to the uh, the first session ever uh, of the Constitutional Transitions Colloquium. My name is uh, Sujit Chowdhury, and I teach here at, uh, at the law school. So maybe I'll just say uh, just a couple of words about what this colloquium is. This colloquium is a component of the activities of the Center for Constitutional Transitions. Uh, and our mission uh, at the center is to support constitutional transitions through research and education, and one platform for that uh, is the colloquium. Uh, the colloquium meets uh, throughout the entire academic year. We have 12 uh, speakers in total. Uh, the format for the colloquium is um, similar to that of other academic colloquia at the law school. We uh, invite leading experts uh, who work on issues of relevance to the center uh, to um, present an academic paper uh, in an academic setting, uh, and then uh, we have a we have a discussion about it. The 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 ambit of the center's activities in, in conceptually are very broad. We have focused this year uh, on uh, the Middle East and North Africa because, of course, that's where there is a lot of um, constitutional uh, transition happening right now. And so the theme for this year uh, is uh, the Middle East revolutions uh, for the colloquium. But in other in future years, as our activities uh, expand globally, uh, we'll be drawing on experts and issues uh, that face transitions uh, around the world. Uh, so it gives me a great uh, pleasure uh, to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Intasar Rob, uh, who recently um, accepted her offer uh, to join NYU where she is cross-appointed uh, to Middle East Studies and also the, the law school. And uh, she is visiting this fall uh, um, at the Harvard Law School. Uh, where she's teaching courses on Islamic constitutionalism and Islamic law, and she will be uh, coming to back to New York uh, in January uh, to co-convene the colloquium with me, uh, in addition uh, to joining um, our academic community. And so, uh, and she, her, the title of her paper uh, is The Least of the Religious Branch, uh, The New Islamic Constitutionalism After the Arab Spring. It's a very topical, very timely issue, uh, focusing on Egypt. Uh, but a broader importance. And so the format for today's session will be as follows. Uh, Professor Rob uh, will uh, give about a 20-minute presentation. Um, I will uh, give about 10 minutes uh, of remarks or que uh, with some questions. Uh, we'll proceed to about 2.50, we'll take a break, uh, and then we'll reconvene about five or 10 minutes later and, and go to uh, four o'clock. Uh, so without further ado, um, I'd like to turn it over to Intasar. Thank you very much, Sujit, and thank you uh, to you and Katie uh, for organizing everything so far. Um, very much looking forward to joining in January. And in the meantime, um, very happy to be opening the first session ever uh, in this, this series and, and meeting all of you. And thanks too to friends and colleagues who've come from outside of the, the enrolled colloquium students. So as Sujit said, the title of the paper is The Least Religious Branch, question uh, mark, Islamic Constitutionalism, or as you have it on the schedule, Judicial Review after the Arab Spring. And what I'd like to, to spend the next 20 minutes doing is uh, sort of explaining the question mark. Uh, what, does, what does it mean to uh, have judicial review in context of Islamic constitutionalism, uh, which, which I want to unpack after the Arab Spring, and what really is the, uh, the, the benefit or the harm um, of that. So conversations about Islamic law in particular after the events of last year in the Middle East and North Africa have become even more central uh, since Islamists won parliamentary elections uh, in Egypt and elsewhere, um, the presidential elections, and all of this is happening against the backdrop of Islamic constitutionalism. What is Islamic constitutionalism? So about 27 countries by last count count Islamic law or the there's a constitutional clause that says Islamic law shall be a source or the source of state law. This is the Sharia clause. And this means then that courts are interpreting uh, what Islamic law is when cases come to the court that, that challenge some aspect of, of state legislation on grounds of being uh, sufficiently or insufficiently Islamic. And this doesn't happen in a vacuum, of course. This is a part of 
the broader constitutional scheme where there are other liberal rights provisions, um, other provisions guiding the constitutional structure. So Egypt is no different. It, it, it's Egypt that we'll look to as, as the example. So there last year, um, Islamists won some two-thirds majority of the parliament. Uh, the Freedom and Justice Party, the political party of the Muslim Brotherhood, won 45%. And the Islamist Salafi Party, another orientation toward Islam and Islamic law, called the Anur Party, won 25%. Uh, we'll talk about how relevant that remains um, when we talk about what's happened to the parliament since, but the fact is that Islamists won some two-thirds of a majority of parliament when it came to the ballot box. Um, the same happened in the presidential sphere. Uh, as you remember, there was a runoff, um, or as you may have read about or heard about in the news, there was a runoff election between uh, the current president, Mohamed Morsi, who comes from the Freedom and Justice Party of the Muslim Brotherhood, and the former Mubarak regime, uh, Prime Minister Ahmed Shafiq, and, and uh, Morsi took the presidency. So all of this as background prompts questions in the comparative uh, constitutional law context about how we might contain an Islamist threat to democratic rule if we perceive these elections um, and the results of them and the placement of religion now at the center of politics where it previously was excluded uh, by decree under the pre-Arab Spring regimes. If we place religion at the center and, and, and the idea is that religion uh, attempts or the, the religiously <coughs> affiliated elected parties attempt to dominate the system with religious rules rather than democratic rules, how do we contain that threat uh, to democratic rule? The legislature offers no comfort. We just said that they occupy the majority of, of parliament. The executive offers no comfort. It's either Islamist itself as in Egypt or it's authoritarian still, uh, or both. And it remains to be seen whether that applies to Egypt. And then the military, which we here don't typically think of as a branch of government, but which uh, sometimes serves in that role, Pakistan and Turkey are examples of the military playing a heavy role in, in uh, guiding or maintaining certain constitutional values and constitutional orderings in those systems. The military now seems not to uh, be in that role either. Uh, last August 8th, President Morsi stripped the, the military leaders of their power, uh, placed those affiliated with um, or, or sympathetic to him in place. And so you have dominance in that area too. So then what's left? The courts and judicial review seem to offer the best answer for how to maintain a constitutional democratic order uh, that, that is workable. And in fact, that was the answer of comparative constitutional law scholars before the Arab Spring and after the Arab Spring. Uh, it's that judicial review, one argument says that courts and judicial review have a secularizing effect. And there's something about constitutionalism uh, that is necessarily neutral, that gets to liberal rights regarding outcomes that should, should be the best hope, offer the best hope of containing any Islamist threat to democracy, religious threat to democracy, um, and mostly it's through this neutral rights-based reasoning and the secularizing effect that, that that yields. So I wanna argue that, I wanna make three arguments here about this claim that courts will best guard, or judicial review will best guard constitutional democracy because of the secularizing effect and, and because of something that's, that's inherent to constitutionalism and the process of judicial review itself. First, I think this notion is conceptually flawed. It thinks of Islamic law incorporated into Article 2 of the Egyptian Constitution as 
a static text, and as the and and with that, the court not engaging it. Um, so Islamic law is a set of rules that the court uh, feels free and in fact does disregard on this view. And secondly, I want to argue that this is normatively flawed, that this view counseled against the court engaging in deliberations about Islamic law in favor of overlaying those decisions <coughs> with liberal norms. This is a mistake in terms of constitutional, uh, on, the, on the backdrop of the constitutional design, which incorporates both Islamic law and uh, the liberal rights base, uh, or liberal rights clauses that should be on this view overlaid or, or placed over the Islamic law clause. Um, and this is problematic in that uh, it may prevent looking to a model that adopted this view as being a, an exportable model, precisely at a time where we're looking for workable models in the region. And third, uh, and this is, this is part of a larger argument then about new constitutionalism, this idea that courts are central to ensuring constitutional democracy and, uh, and they do so with respect to rights reasoning. This is a part of that new, uh, and this is, this is a global phenomenon, um, but this is, a, this is a part of the new constitutionalism argument that might not fit one fifth, some one fifth of the world population um, where Islamic constitutionalism or some appeal to Islamic law may be in effect. So in the Islamic constitutionalism world, the secularizing effects narrative is complicated in addition by certain factors that make it politically difficult and constitutionally problematic for courts to simply contain religion. So first, religion and specifically consideration of Sharia, Islamic law, is itself a right or a constitutional law clause in that context, and it has deep historical roots and popular appeal as the elections point to. And second, strong judicial review over matters of religion through contests over Sharia or the meaning of Sharia and certain political rights for Islamists and other opposition groups emerged in a form that was entangled with and it came as a consequence of the executive trying to uh, delegate power to the courts to build up economic-based rights that would, that would support the executive. So it's, it's the presence of strong judicial review in the Muslim world isn't inspired by Article II Sharia clauses, um, but it's there, and, that, and since it's been there in Egypt, it, it applies to it in the same way that it applies to the economics rights clauses that, uh, that the executive was willing to yield power to the, to the courts in the first place to review. And third, the resulting power and centrality of the courts, despite the, non, despite the lack of origins in Article II Sharia clause um, bases, um, then take on exaggerated importance after the Arab Spring. So after the Islamist victories in parliament and, and in the executive branches, uh, we'll talk about this a little bit. Um, there have been you know, a series of, of crises of constitutional proportions that stretch over the traditional branches of government. And within this context, Islamic law relevant or not, the courts become central to, re to resolving those claims. It happens to be the case, though, um, again, as the election showed that Islamic law is relevant to those questions. So I want to just unpack all of this a little bit uh, with respect to three cases to uh, sort of elucidate what I mean by how the court is, in fact, interpreting and <coughs> what that may suggest to us about uh, what judgments we make as a comparative constitutional law matter about the role of judicial review and the secularizing of <coughs> So 
there are three cases that have come up that came up in the mid uh, 90s and, and early 2000s. One, and, and these, these all seem to be cases where there's a conflict between Islamic law clauses and rights clauses where the court should uh, come up with, with liberal uh, outcomes and in fact did come out with liberal outcomes by which we have this argument that yes, courts do play a secularizing role and they should. And in part, I want to question whether that narrative applies to these cases. The first two are easy cases, and we can talk about those in short order. I think there's only one real case that presents a genuine conflict. So the first case is the headscarf or face veil case. So in 1996, uh, the education minister of Egypt issues an edict saying that schoolgirls will be barred from wearing the headscarf and face veil initially in class, um, in, right, in school. And uh, the, the ban was modified to include just face veils after some outcries by uh, parents who said that, well, you have to grant us that at least the headscarf is, is uh, you know, central to our religious practice and we would like to have our, our schoolgirls wear the headscarf in class um, as, a, as a symbol of, of their, or as a practice of their religion. So the headscarf ban was modified to only exclude face veils. But that didn't end the matter because these same parents said, well, the face veils are also central to our religious practice. And you have to grant us that wearing a face veil is a part of religious practice. So the case, the, the education minister doesn't modify the ban anymore and the case goes to court. So in court, the uh, Supreme Court or the Supreme Constitutional Court as it's called in Egypt, the justices there evaluated the case. They looked at what the Quran said about uh, head covering, face veiling, if anything, um, modesty and concluded that there was a universal consensus amongst classical jurists who had interpreted the matter that the headscarf uh, was a religious practice, um, the face veil was a disputed religious practice, not something that was, that was uh, <coughs> uniformly obligatory, at least under the classical version um, of Islamic law, and that therefore uh, there was some room to interpret there was disagreement, there was some ambiguity about the question of the face veil. In that room to interpret, there's an Islamic law rule that comes up again and again in these court cases that says there's a principle of no harm. And the court concluded that wearing a face veil, in fact, would violate the Islamic law principle of no harm. And through that principle, they drew in uh, other constitutional principles, the right of women uh, to participate in the workforce, equality provisions, uh, and concluded that wearing a face veil would actually potentially take women outside of the workforce or have severely harmful social effects that in fact make it, uh, make the ban uh, constitutional, the ban against face veils con constitutional, and they let the allowance for the headscarf stand. What's interesting there is that the court looked to both, in this way, looked to both Islamic law clauses and used that to draw in the rights, the other constitutional liberal rights clauses and, and came to this conclusion um, where they're balancing, but in fact incorporating the liberal rights provisions into the Islamic law analysis. So this wasn't really a case of a conflict between Islamic law and liberal rights it was the court uh, doing an analysis and deciding that the two actually coincided to support the ban. So that's one case. Second case is a, uh, the family law reform, a case of no-fault women's divorce uh, called Khola. And this basically is a, is a procedure where um, typically you have to have grounds for divorce um, if you're a woman in Egypt. 
and uh, this family law reform said, well, here's a procedure that women can get divorced with um, or, or initiate a divorce in a court with or without the consent of her husband. And um, in return, she must um, give up uh, financial entitlements that she otherwise would have been entitled to from the marriage. So one of, one of the, uh, a man from Alexandria with Islamist um, orientation says that this is unconstitutional because it goes against Islamic law, which he reads as saying that there's a unilateral right to divorce uh, for men only. And for a divorce to occur, beyond that it has to come at least with the permission um, or the agreement, the consent of the husband. So here the court does an analysis similar to the one that it does in the headscarf veiling case, and it looks at what the classical texts, uh, the, the Quran and the body of prophetic reports, the Sunnah, uh, Hadith, that outline or provide the basic text for what Islamic law is um, said about divorce provisions, and it looked at how the jurists classically interpreted those provisions. And it concluded that, uh, in fact, this procedure was completely non-controversial. Um, there wasn't even the sort of dispute that you had in the headscarf failing case. Uh, the women's no-fault divorce procedure was something that was a classically recognized procedure, both in the uh, foundational text and as jurists interpreted it and so they concluded that the ban or, or the, the law, the 2002 family law reform, was in fact constitutional um, because it did not violate Islamic law um, in that case. They also cited the liberal rights provisions as support for, uh, in the Constitution as support for their conclusion. So here again, there's no real conflict uh, here. Uh, the Islamic law rule accords with uh, the liberal rights rules, both, uh, so the, the legislation is constitutional on both grounds. Now the final case is one where there was a conflict. And this is uh, a female circumcision or female genital mutilation, FGM case, in the late 90s. So this was a case where the Minister of Health banned the practice of female circumcision completely. They had tried it before, it failed before, but this was a complete ban that, that sought to uh, fill in any loopholes of, of earlier attempts to ban it. And it was contested um, on religious grounds uh, with the idea that there are some um, in Egypt, actually it's, it, it was at the time a pretty prevalent practice uh, to perform female circumcision on young girls. And they did so, those who brought the case did so, saying that this was a religious, uh, not just practice, but obligation. And to ban it would be to ban religion, to ban Islamic practice. That clearly was unconstitutional, at least under Article 2. So here the court uh, does its similar analysis. It looks to see what the foundational texts, what the Quran and the Sunnah, the sayings and actions of the Prophet Muhammad had to say about this practice. They didn't find very much there. It's not mentioned in the Quran. There is some reference to it in the Sunnah, uh, but it, it wasn't completely conclusive, uh, although supported in the text on their need. Then they look at the classical interpretive tradition amongst jurors. And they see there that, well, yes, the, the practice of female circumcision was a disputed one in part, but not disputed as to whether it was possible, only dis permissible, only disputed as to whether it was obligatory. So they don't read into that, uh, you know, a dispute about the validity of the practice. And so they, they quickly um, sort of allied that discussion. If you read the case, I think it's about 20 pages. Um, typically, this part of the discussion will take a few pages. Here, it's, it's one paragraph. So they quickly jump from that discussion 
to the principle, the Islamic law principle of no harm, and conclude based on, or, or use that principle to look at the rights, the liberal rights provisions in the Constitution to say that this is actually a harmful practice. Uh, if you look at the reports of, of doctors that underlie the health minister's ban, and on that basis, um, this is unconstitutional, it's un-Islamic and therefore unconstitutional. Uh, but everyone knew that the court was sort of hedging. It hadn't really, um, it, it sidelined the Islamic law question um, through this truncated ana analysis in order to get to this outcome that those who support the notion that courts have secularizing effects um, point to and champion as, as the court performing the role as it's supposed to perform it. Uh, so here it seems like uh, the court gave uh, liberal and therefore secular outcomes in each of these cases. Um, but what I really wanted to emphasize is that in each case, the court, through its procedure of interpretation, actually engaged in um, some Islamic legal analysis per the dictates <coughs> of Article 2, as well as tried to balance it. Um, but again, through a connection to the Article 2 clause, the Sharia clause, um, with the liberal rights provisions. And, and what I want to uh, sort of interrogate then is, is this, this last question, what would happen um, in cases like that where there is an actual conflict between what the Islamic law rule is and, and the liberal secular outcome um, and, and what the court would do in a post-Arab uh, spring regime when now the question of legislation that, that comes to the courts would probably fall around different lines. It wouldn't be um, challenges to legislation for being too liberal if, if we follow the, the line that the Islamist parties will probably um, have an agenda, a legislative agenda that is a conservative one. And there's some indication of that if you read the Freedom and Justice Party uh, platform, <coughs> party platform. So the, the questions that, that come to the court or the challenges that come to the court won't be that legislation is too liberal and insufficiently Islamic, uh, but it'll be uh, challenges to legislation that, is, that, that has a conservative um, Islamic interpretation or background. And here, should the court be as deferential uh, to, uh, to the legislation as it was in, in the cases that we looked at, if we read this as, as it being deferential, or should it simply sideline the Islamic law uh, position and uh, secularize as, as, the, as one proposal uh, would have it? That can be extremely problematic. This, the FGM case yielded a, a huge backlash um, popularly all across Egypt. Um, at a time where Islamists were outside of political power and had no chance of being in political power. Political parties that were, that were religious in orientation were completely banned. Of course, this changes after the Arab Spring. Um, so what do you do um, in a case like this where it seems politically either impossible or um, problematic for the court to issue decisions like it did in the FGM case, where now you have the, the possibility of legislative overrides um, or, or other action in the Islamist-dominated parliament, um, executive, uh, and other arenas of society. So, so just to, to end, uh, what I want to do is, is, is end with what you would have read in the paper as sort of um, very roughly sketched out proposals for um, what the court might do differently. In the FGM case, after the decision came down, in fact, the uh, traditionally trained scholars got together, Ali Goma, who is the head of, or the Grand Mufti, the head of um, 
the, the body that, that interprets Islamic law with no um, binding enforcement power, but the ability to articulate um, what the Islamic legal position would be on a particular issue in Egypt and recognizes that. Um, so here he says that uh, he convened the conference, got together other jurists and scholars and uh, activists and doctors um, and assessed the matter about whether FGM was actually an Islamic based rule and concluded that given the facts and changing circumstances over time, Islamic principle, if you plug the facts into the Islamic principles by which uh, FGM was uh, made permissible or even obligatory in classical times, it no longer is permissible or obligatory. In fact, it's, it is harmful and therefore prohibited. Uh, and so he uh, issued a fatwa, an advisory opinion about the Islamic legal position on the matter saying that, uh, saying just this, that the FGM um, is not even an Islamic practice, and that sort of ratifies what the court decision was. Uh, so within that, might it be helpful, might not it be helpful to include more rather than less deliberation about Islamic law in court cases where more information about uh, the content of Islamic law can help in the interpretive process that the justices on the Supreme Court, the Supreme Constitutional Court, must go through as they're considering legislation about Islamic law that may have a different flavor after the Arab Spring. And there are many ways that could come in, maybe as uh, directing the parties in the adversarial uh, system, much like this one, to brief certain issues of Islamic law, asking amici um, friends of the court to perhaps designated friends of the court recognized as experts to brief issues of Islamic law, or including some sort of um, look at domestic and transnational uh, briefs or organizations on on Islamic law. Um, so, so remember that the justices are not at all trained in Islamic law. They will have had perhaps the same number of courses available to them. Um, in Islamic law as you do, um, which is at least one this year. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and so they're, they're not doing this as experts in Islamic law. They simply recognize the Sharia clause as one of many clauses in the, in the Constitution. So um, I will end with that. There are many um, sort of changes that, that have uh, happened in Egypt as to the, the political struggles between the branches in the, in the last year that I brought up in the paper and we can certainly talk about um, in, as, as we discuss. But what I, what I do want to end with is just um, highlighting the importance of, uh, of the courts to resolving the issues that are likely to come before it and challenge again the notion that Islamic law um, or that courts writ large are uh, secularizing agents where they have a necessarily secularizing effect, and more importantly, challenging the notion that they should. Okay, terrific. So, uh, so I just want to uh, offer a few comments on Intasar's uh, very engaging paper before we uh, open it up to more general discussion. And so I have the three main points uh, I want to uh, highlight or flag. Uh, the first, uh, is that I want to uh, juxtapose uh, Intasar's arguments against uh, another literature that's grown up around the Supreme Constitutional Court. And I'm thinking here of the work that Tamar Mustafa has done uh, that has kind of posed the question, why would an authoritarian regime uh, create a court that enjoyed a great degree of independence, at least for a number of years? So that's actually an interesting puzzle in, in compared to constitutional politics. Uh, the second is I want to offer um, a, a, a reaction to her um, exchange or debate with Ron Herschel uh, about the secularizing impact of, of the Supreme Constitutional Court or, or the lack thereof uh, through the lens of the counter majoritarian dilemma, um, which, is, uh, which is alluded to by her title, The Least Religious Branch. Uh, and then finally, uh, I want to bring uh, together the, the two strands of, of, of this type of analysis uh, in this post-authoritarian moment uh, that we're in right now uh, in Egypt and, and, and pose some questions about how the two agendas might be linked. Uh, 
so the so the so so the background. So Tara Mustafa uh, has written um, probably the best book length study of the Supreme Constitutional Court, and, and the argument in brief uh, is, is this: that that the Supreme Constitutional Court has the power of constitutional judicial review. Uh, it's it's it operated for many years rather independently. Uh, it was created by an authoritarian ruler uh, during an, uh, uh, while Egypt was under authoritarian rule, and the question is why, right? And moreover, the, the court acted actually quite independently in a way that seemed to to um, to uh, undermine uh, some of the political agenda of the regime. So it promoted electoral reform, freedom of expression. It provided a platform, an institutional space for opposition parties, human rights groups, and political activists to challenge the regime. So why would this court be? Uh, allowed to operate and continue. And so the, the answer that he gives uh, is that the, 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 the reason for the creation of the court uh, was to invest private investment capital uh, to Egypt. And, and in, in order, and the, and the idea was uh, it would do, so, it was part of the strategy to uh, enhance protection for private property rights uh, and as part of a neoliberal economic uh, policy. And so the court uh, was a form of credible, credible commitment uh, to private investors uh, that rendered their investments uh, safe from um, legislative expropriation, executive fiat, uh, and so on. And so, but once created, the court developed a life of its own. And, and, and so uh, it was used by actors uh, who were not originally designed to be its beneficiaries uh, to mobilize legally uh, and to, uh, and it provided an opening uh, for those actors uh, to bring uh, human rights uh, and civil rights uh, claims. And, and the SEC was complicit uh, in this broadening of its mission uh, because, of course, uh, it enhanced its institutional power uh, within the Egyptian constitutional state. Uh, but it's, it, even in this initial phase, there were some red lines uh, that the court didn't cross. Uh, so, for example, a, a huge issue uh, in Egypt has been the relative, the respective jurisdictions of the civilian and military courts. Um, and, uh, and, the, and the Supreme Constitutional Court has consistently um, upheld broad notions of military court jurisdiction or, or more accurately not interfered in those cases. Uh, and as well, um, the, the, the court uh, acted in a counter-majoritarian role, but often in the service of the executive's interest. So for example, striking down socialist era legislation that the executive did not want to expend the political capital on to repeal uh, through parliament. Uh, later, uh, the court was reined in um, about a decade ago, uh, and so uh, with the appointment of a new uh, chief justice. And, and then you have a transition, okay? And, and what is, of course, striking about the Egyptian transition is that the, many of the pre-existing institutions remained in place. And so, uh, and so, uh, and so there has been litigation uh, in all uh, types, all manner uh, of Egyptian court regarding uh, elements of, of the transition, uh, including uh, the Supreme Constitutional Court. And, and so the key case of, is, the, is the parliamentary elections case, uh, where the court struck down uh, the regime, uh, creating the system of parliamentary uh, elections in March, and, and it did so uh, against all expectations uh, in a very uh, quick fashion, whereas in the past, when it considered these cases, it often delayed its ruling for years. Uh, after the election, uh, it issued a, a remedy with uh, immediate effect. Uh, it dissolved the entire parliament. Uh, it did so uh, in the midst of the campaigning for the second round of the two round elections, and threw into question uh, the legality of the uh, enactments um, passed by the parliament. Uh, most importantly, uh, the statute creating the Constituent Assembly, and so. The, and, 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 it, and this was largely viewed as a strike against the Brotherhood, uh, given that the Brotherhood had obtained very strong support in, in the March election. So my first question uh, to Intasar is that the court has a history, right? The court has a history uh, under the Mubarak regime. Uh, it has a history uh, in the transition period, and it has a history that, that, that arguably has set it on a collision course uh, with the Muslim Brotherhood. And so it seems to me that this is a very important part of the political context uh, within which to uh, engage in kind of a more detailed examination of how the court might approach the adjudication uh, of the Egyptian constitution. And so, uh, and so the, the argument might be uh, that the interpretive stance of the court on how to read uh, Article 2 alongside the rights protecting provisions of the Egyptian constitution might be endogenous uh, to the regime, right? And so that is, um, under, under the previous regime, uh, the court adopted a certain interpretation uh, that was arguably liberal, 
uh, because of the character of the regime under which it operated. But as the regime has shifted, the question is, will the interpretive sh stance shift as well as power shifted? So that's one question. So the, the, uh, another issue that, um, that uh, Intisar addresses in her paper uh, is exactly this question of how to uh, read Article 2 type clauses, which are widespread in the Islamic world alongside schedules of bills of rights, which are also widespread uh, in the Islamic world. And the question is, how do you read these two things together? Right? And so the paper, I think, does a terrific job of, of, kind of juxtaposing and contrasting uh, two ways of imagining the relationship between these two different sets of provisions to try to harmonize them. Uh, the one is uh, what Ron Herschel has called the, kind of the phenomenon of secularization. And, and I think as Intasar rightly says, the idea here is that uh, when Islamic law and bills of rights collide, then one has to give. And what gives is Islamic law, right? And the bills of rights kind of override it. And they take uh, kind of priority over other parts of the Constitution. And the other is uh, a strategy of what I would say is one of harmonization uh, or uh, reform from within, uh, which tries to read uh, the to Islamic legal sources with, through a liberal light uh, in a way that reaches the same result, but with a different kind of justification. And so there, there's, there's this clash um, between their two bodies of work over what exactly the Supreme, the Supreme Constitutional Court did. Okay? Did it actually engage in a secularizing type of interpretation of the Constitution, or did it do what Intasar did? But there's another angle on this debate. And so, um, and so the title, as I mentioned, uh, of Intasar's paper invokes Bickle uh, and the counter majoritarian dilemma. And so one lens through which to look at the cases that Intasar discusses is that they were all cases in which the court upheld laws uh, that were supported by and passed by the regime. And so the question is, you know, what bearing does adding that element um, have uh, to Intasar's analysis? And so, uh, and so you might think about it this way, that there were three important constituencies um, who were, uh, whose interests uh, the court had to adjudicate upon uh, in these cases. Uh, there was the, the executive or the, and the executive dominated legislature that had passed these laws, or in some cases, these, these were actually decrees passed by the executive itself that had an, an agenda that it was trying to pursue. Uh, you had uh, the Islamists, uh, who basically invoked the jurisdiction of the court to try to uh, second guess the policies of the, of the executive. Uh, and then you had the court itself. And, and let's kind of work with the hypothesis that the court itself was committed to rights. And it wanted to find a way uh, to, to vindicate uh, the rights protecting provisions of the Constitution. And so if that's the way to think about this, then in a sense the court's judgments gave someone something to everybody, right? So that is, the government wins because its policies are upheld. Uh, the Islamists at least get a, re a judgment that's reasoned in, in terms of Islamic law, so it legitimizes the judgment in the eyes of, of, of a constituency that brought the case to it. Uh, and then the, and the court wins uh, because the court protect rights, protects rights, okay? And so, the, so there's something for everyone, okay? And so the question is, um, what happens uh, when things change, right? What happens when the character of the laws that come before the court um, aren't rights protecting, okay, but are rights infringing. Okay, and that's what you allude to, right, as being what might happen. And so you have a different type of a case. And so if you have the three uh, interests at stake, you have the court's interests, you have the interests uh, of Islamists and the interests of the government, well, this might be a case where the court really can't have it in the way that it wants, or, or the court uh, has to set itself in opposition uh, to uh, even if it reasons if it reasons in terms of Islamic law uh, to appeal or legitimize its judgments in the eyes of Islamists, uh, and it also it defers to government, uh, then the question is, can it also vindicate rights as well? So this type of this this sort of optimization, as it were, uh, uh, for all the three interests, just might not be possible anymore, right? And so the way in which, and the broader point is that the way in which the court adjudicates these Article Two cases might not just be a function of interpretive legal arguments within the court, but about the external political environment uh, within the court, within which the court operates, which has changed very much. Uh, the last point uh, is this, that is, there is um, an emerging politics of judicial appointment in Egypt. And so what, what has really um, escaped a lot of attention uh, is that the court is um, very anxious uh, about what might happen to it uh, in a post-Mubarak Egypt. And so, uh, and so in June 2011, uh, the SCAF, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, uh, passed a proclamation that changed the appointment procedure to the court 
And what it did was to transfer the appointing power away from the executive to a three-judge council uh, chaired by the Chief Justice of the Court, whose decisions would then have to be ratified uh, by the General Assembly and the Supreme Court, which is quite a large body. And so one way of, of looking, and so what, 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 what happened here is that the court is engaging in self-preservation uh, to try to insulate itself. And this is quite evocative of the Indian approach to, judicial, to appointments of the Supreme Court, which follows the same approach. And so what we see happening uh, is, in a sense, um, elements of the old regime that have survived um, trying to syndicalize and, and balkanize the, the Egyptian state. Uh, so it might not be that the Egyptian state is, is a monolith, but there's a variety of actors who occupy different spaces within it who are now uh, using legal forms uh, to, to, uh, to protect themselves uh, against what, what might be coming. And so the, so, the, so the question is, what happens now, right? What happens now um, after there, there is um, another election and we have um, a, a parliament that's elected that's likely to have um, very significant brotherhood um, representation. What's the, what, what happens now to the, to, the court, to, the, to the composition of the court? And again, to what extent can we understand the court's approach to Article 2 cases as being some type of a defensive response uh, to preempt um, a, um, a change in the composition of the court uh, to give something to Islamists by becoming uh, perhaps uh, less counter authoritarian So that, those are some questions. So, so rather than have you discuss them right now, maybe we'll, we'll open it up and then we'll, we'll let you get back to these in the course of the discussion. So, all right, so let's, let's start. So who wants to start? Who wants to start? Barry. So I, I found all this extremely interesting and thank you. The, it strikes me in a way as a be careful what you wish for sort of story for everybody. So I'm sympathetic to the sort of institutional analysis that Sue just talking about, but uh, but to take your sort of internalist perspective and say, you know, we have a constitution that invokes uh, uh, Islamic law, and so the judges should be interpreting <coughs> that law, even though, as you point out, they don't have any particular expertise in interpreting that law, uh, seems like it could go one of two ways, and I don't have any way to choose between them. I'm interested in your views. One is. Uh, it's be careful what you wish for in terms of the people that wanted uh, Islamic law written into the constitutions because having done that, they will now secularize Islamic law. Uh, that to the extent that uh, courts interpreting that law have any, uh, uh, any sway over Islamic law and to the extent that those courts are secular at all, which remains open to question, uh, and to the extent there's any sway or uh, room for interpretation in Islamic law, what you're going to get is you're going to get uh, a watering down of Islamic law. And so, you know, people that, that hoped that they would change regimes by incorporating Islamic law might find that what they've ended up doing is changing Islamic law. Uh, on the other hand, then, there's the flip side of the story, which is the one Suj is pointing to, which is, uh, you know, but again, it all depends on who's sitting on that court and what their instincts are. And so, everybody who wants constitutional courts to have review power uh, because they think there's something innate in, in constitutional courts in terms of secularization, you are right. It's just it doesn't have to be. Uh, and maybe they will interpret Islamic law, but maybe they'll interpret it in conservative ways. Uh, either because that's their instinct after an appointments process that puts religious conservatives on the court or because they feel like they're under political pressure like the suit suggests. And so uh, without having any clue how any of it plays out, I'm guessing it'll play out differently everywhere. It seems like there's room for caution for everyone. Yeah, I, I would say that that's, that's fair. Um, and you raise a really interesting um, set of points in, in this be careful what you wish for. Uh, because we might assume that those who agitated for, um, or those who in fact did the incorporation of Islamic law were the Islamists who, who wanted to see Islamic law uh, represented in the constitutional scheme. Um, but in fact, it was the uh, it was the Sadat regime, the, the president before Mubarak, um, who may have had some, there's a dispute about whether he had any Islamist religious tendencies, but he very much ruled as a secular, authoritarian, unitary, uber unitary executive um, who had a legitimacy problem, um, both because the economy was in shambles and that's what uh, Tamar Mustafa points to as uh, his, as the motivating force behind him delegating some of the, or yielding some of the power that he had to the courts and empowering the court with, with judicial review. 
Um, but he also had a legitimacy problem in terms of religious legitimacy. Uh, there is a popular valence to uh, Islamists, not political parties, but civic organizations uh, that he wanted to co-opt, um, diffuse, and a way of doing that was to say, well, well, look, we're an Islamic law regime as well, and we'll do that by not only putting Islamic law as a source in the Constitution, <coughs> um, which is the 1971 language that, that he directed to be incorporated into the new Constitution of Egypt, but by also making Islamic law the main source of legislation, um, at least according to the Constitution, um, as he revised it in 1980, in large part still in response to, to uh, popular unrest extending from, from the economic problems that sort of weakened the presidency. So he's looking for strength by making Egypt um, more Islamically oriented. Um, but your, your question there still stands as far as, as the Islamists are concerned, um, and this question about, well, does this mean that um, courts and, and institutions that are not Islamist or, or Islamically oriented um, control the meaning of Sharia and therefore it will secularize in that way? Um, so so that, that goes to uh, the changes that, that Suji pointed to um, now that we have uh, you know, a, a non sadat regime, we have Morsi, who is Islamist himself, and he would have been the type that would have incorporated Islamic law into the Constitution. Yes, maybe for religious legitimacy, um, but with some some legislative punch behind it that would that would accompany it. Um, and and so with those changes, uh, then the big question becomes, um, you know, well, how do you? Uh, and this goes to to the second part of your question about the constitutionalization and and. Uh, you know whether we conceive of that as secularization. How do you, uh, you know, look at the question of Article Two um, in a way that can apply before and after an Islamized institutional structure? And so that's really um, what I'm what I'm interested in getting at in in seeking to explore what we think about constitutionalism that incorporates these Islamic law clauses, rights protecting clauses, um, that uh, makes constitutional sense irrespective of the character of uh, the regime or those appointing people to the court, as Suji pointed to. Um, court packing happened under Mubarak, it weakened the court, it can happen under the new regime. So that'll change the character of the court. Um, so what is it about the mandate of interpretation um, and how we understand that as a matter of, of constitutionalism uh, that, should, that should apply regardless of the people and the effects of the institutions? Okay, so I'm going to start taking a cue. Um, yes, over here. Um, so your main strategy seems to be that you try to avoid conflicts between Islamic law and constitutional principles by interpreting or trying to seek interpretations of the Islamic law that are not in conflict with the liberal rights of, of, of the constitution. Now, um, I know very little about Islamic law, but it seems... And just to clarify, I think that's what the court may be trying to do, and that's the argument that that's what the court is doing, not my argument. Okay, okay. Um, so... Um, so it, it, it seems, at least from the discussion, um, <coughs> that they need to refer to some authority so that they can't interpret themselves, but that they mm -hmm. always refer to the discussion within the uh, within uh, scholars of, of Islamic law. So that and um, so so what happens if there's really a, a hard conflict? So something where we can't reconcile uh, principles of Islamic law with um, uh, with principles of the, um, w with, with, with liberal rights in the Constitution or, or some other principles in the Constitution. Um, what, um, how would you resolve this, this kind of conflict? Yeah, that's, a, that's uh, a great question that gets to the hard cases, like the FGM case, where there seemed to be an actual conflict. The court didn't see a way to resolve what it took to be the Islamic law 
stance on FGM and the rights regarding stance um, or outcome for uh, with respect to FGM and um, and so when I said that that's what the court is doing um, I'm not hedging um, or not trying to hedge but but in saying that the court before it before that and the other cases that we talked about you know it actually tried to do this balancing or harmonization it found that it couldn't in the last case uh, my argument there is that it was an information deficit um, about what Islamic law was or could be. Um, so they are doing interpretation themselves, but they are referring to it an interpretive tradition that's not exactly clear on what its rules are. There are some standards, there are principles, and there are ways of interpreting within that tradition that judges with some minimal understanding of Islamic law might not have access to exploring uh, more fully. And so then my argument there is how do they um, fill in the information gap? And maybe that calls for judges uh, looking on who, who face these hard cases looking for more information um, about what Islamic law is. And that's not to say that that's going to resolve the issue either. There still could be a conflict after all of that. Um, but the, the benefit of that is that uh, the court thereby would would get the legitimacy, um, you know, the check on the side of legitimacy that Suji talked about as one of the um, sort of benefits of the judi judicial review in the first place. The Islamists get something out of, um, and the court themselves get something out of um, reason and deliberation about these issues of Islamic law. Here, if there's a perception that they haven't actually deliberated about it and they sidelined it instead of getting more information and then making a decision, even if it's one that still conflicts um, with Islamic law, um, then I think that uh, exacerbates rather than solves the legitimacy problem. Okay, so some other um, Okay, Calypso? Um, yeah, I was just uh, wanting to complex, uh, to ask you to complexify the story a bit coming back to endogenous and endogenization and taking into account that the third leg of the triangle, the, the Islamists that we've taken as a whole until now in the conversation, are actually hugely fragmented themselves in Egypt. And we mm -hmm. know it's not just the Salafists versus the non-Salafists, but it's also the youth branch of the Islam Brotherhood that split. And we, we know that there's a huge amount of, of contestation within the Islamic movement. Um, and so um, to what extent could we hypothesize that actually this might empower this kind of court activism with, or at least this kind of active harmonization wall within, within the contestation within political Islam itself by being used in different ways by different factions? How, do you, how would you kind of tell that version of the story, which is likely to be what we see in the coming month and year? Yeah. Excellent intervention, uh, because you're right, I mean, there, there's not one Islamic law, there's not one proponent of Islamic law, even amongst the Islamists who are um, in the now dissolved parliament. Um, you know, the Anur party um, has, a, has a Salafi, more conservative interpretation. The Muslim Brotherhood um, has another version that might fall somewhere between the Anur party um, in terms of, of particular um, you know, legislative agenda that, that they're willing to pursue. Um, if you look at the FJP platform right now, for example, there's a lot about reforming the educational system uh, to have a curriculum that teaches a certain version of Islamic law, which is different from the version of Islamic law that the Salafi party um, agrees with or would want to teach in the schools. And then all of that is different from what the jurists, the classically trained jurists um, at Al-Azhar might come up with um, and one version of that is, is what we saw in the FJM, uh, FJM case. And, and there's a tremendous amount of diversity there, even amongst um, Islamist parties and those advocating for that. So yeah, that's extremely important. And then it might make us look at the role of the court as not just a harmonizer <coughs> between rights provisions and Islamic law provisions to the extent that they uh, diverge from the outcomes that, that the court might arrive at with respect to the rights provisions, but a mediator between competing conceptions of Islamic law um, for which, uh, to my mind, this, this is another argument in favor of 
um, getting more uh, information or interpretation about what Islamic law is, particularly if the government, as one of the parties to the cases, will now, we know, be either, um, you know, Salafi or Muslim Brotherhood oriented um, if, if it's coming from uh, the legislature. And, and so you'll, you, you'd be getting sort of a few versions of what the Islamic law outcome might be. And then there's a larger universe out there. So I think you're absolutely right. There are many different um, you know, versions of politics and Islamic law conceptions within that. And, and that impacts what the role of the court um, should be, not with respect to the constitutional clauses, but with respect to um, sort of mediating between parties and, and competing views. Kundal. I had a question regarding your conceptual argument that the court hasn't had a secularizing effect. It seems like for step one of the three-part test, there's sort of two ways they could have gone about it. On one hand, they could have said, well, if it's more likely than not that Islamic law would not tolerate such a piece of legislation, we'd strike it down. Or they can set the bar very high, and kind of what we were just discussing in terms of whether we can ever reach that degree of clarity that it's certain that Islamic law prohibits this. And it seems like they went with the latter question, which almost almost makes it seem as if they were erring in favor of the liberal constitutional outcome. So I guess my question is, is your conclusion simply that at the end, really, Islamic law was entirely consistent with the court's decision? Or is there some other explanation for that? Why, why they couched step one the way they did? Interesting question. Why did, why did the court make step one um, a matter of uh, the constitutionality question on the Sharia clause being a matter of whether the text was unambiguously clear and uh, authentically legitimate as to what the Islamic law position was, right? And they tend to say um, that it's not it's not a really clear at step one, and they have to go to step two where where they have a lot of interpretive sway, and maybe even step uh, which is which is to draw in the general principles of Islamic law, and then maybe even step three the sort of no harm principle. Um, and, and so I guess I would say that it's, it's less a matter of um, the substantive outcomes that motivate uh, the judges taking the stance at, towards step one of you know, setting the bar and not really finding clarity, um, and more a matter of vesting in themselves the authority to interpret, the discretion to interpret. If they err on the side of saying that Islamic law is clear, they have no interpretive authority after that, the inquiry ends, um, you know, they can't, they can't sort of do the analysis. And we see this in, uh, you know, case, United States cases all the time where, um, or in the Chevron, um, doctrine and discussions where, you know, if, if a regulation is clear and it's clearly within the ambit of an, an, an agency's interpretive authority, the court should, you know, defer to the agency interpretation. Um, but if it's unclear <coughs> and whenever the court wants to interpret um, or come out with a different outcome, mm -hmm. of course it's going to find some ambiguity and unclarity. It has to in order to do that. So it may be a backward justification of what the court um, was doing. Was that because it was uh, aimed at getting to liberal outcomes? Um, that may that may well have, have been the case in the FGM case, which is the only place I think we can actually test it, because that's the only case um, amongst the ones that I presented where there's an actual conflict. Um, the other ones I do think the court was um, trying to do this balancing, perhaps to get to liberal outcomes, or perhaps to define Islamic law in a way that uh, that got there in a way that wasn't um, an actual conflict with how they read the text. And I think it's more about discretion than the outcomes. Okay, um, okay so I have Rick, and then Sandra, and then Christine. <coughs> so at the end of the day, these, these questions <coughs> about institutional relationships come down to matters of, of cultural and political power of the various actors. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious what you can say as a kind of sociological matter about the 
the perceived legitimacy now of the Egyptian court coming out of the Mubarak era, because obviously political majorities are going to try to capture control of the court in one way or another through the changes in the appointments process or creating you know, new constitutional courts that will take over the functions uh, or in a variety of other ways. And when this power struggle develops, the question will be whether the sort of popular majorities that are out there, to the extent they can be organized and mobilized, um, are they simply going to be inclined to accept the, the will of the elective majorities to control parliament and, and the executive branch, or are they going to express some sort of support for some independent conception of the court that will push back against, effectively push back against efforts by political majorities to gain control of the institution? Mm -hmm. And I guess for me the question is, um, you know, to the extent one can judge these kinds of things, <coughs> Uh, is the court essentially perceived as a tool of the military and the Mubarak regime? And so actually will have very, even though it stood up in certain ways with a certain amount of independence, so that we'll actually have very little reservoir of public support against you know, the overwhelming majority of the, of the Muslim Brotherhood? Or does the court carry some kind of reservoir of, of independent legitimacy and popular and sociological reality in Egypt that will actually uh, enable it to maintain some resistance against the overwhelming political forces that are going to be mobilized against it. I, I don't know if you can. I wish I could predict, uh, but uh, I mean, I, I think there's something to be said that there is there is a reservoir of of independence, as Tamar Mustafa, um, you know told us, um, or, or sort of laid out the case for us in this book, The Struggle for Constitutional Power about the court. Um, you, know, the, you see the court declining um, in, in independence at the waning days of the Mubarak regime. Yet, even, even then, it seems to have um, sort of this, sociologically um, speaking, a, a view of being legitimate, or at least as as a respected place of arbitration. That's my impressionistic view. Um, after the Arab Spring and in, in recent months, it seemed for a while that the court would bend to whatever the military um, told it to do, and it, it in that case would would seem to be just you know, it's like an extension of the Mubarak regime. The dissolution case in particular. Right, where, where dissolved parliament wins its majority Muslim Brotherhood, they dissolve it. Um, the president, um, who is an Islamist, finally after a long uh, questionable time, um, it gets announced <coughs> that, that the Islamist party candidate wins, but then the military um, steps in and says, well, he won, but he has no more power. We have it. Um, and the court allowed that to stand as well, so that was challenged. Um, but then, strangely, um, you know, in August, the the president then turns around, um, and well, in July, reconvenes parliament. The court said that was that was, um, you know, illegitimate, um, and parliament ceased to convene after that, and. Uh, the president also reversed what the military did and invested all the authority that the military took for him in himself, into himself, which also extended over the constituent assembly um, that has the mandate to, to draft the new constitution. <coughs> and the court is supposed to be considering this. Um, a decision was due on <coughs> September 4th. It delayed it uh, again. So we don't know, but um, what we've seen in these past few months in these contests is that the various parties go petition the court as if this the court really is, is an arbiter and whatever the court's decision will be, will be respected. Um, so that's the impression, but what happens going forward, um, I can't tell. I do think that there's a record <coughs> from you know, all indications so far. Uh, Sandra. So thank you very much uh, for your speech today. It was very interesting to hear. Um, I have a question. I'm a little bit curious to hear your opinion on how you believe that perhaps the actual composition of the court and even individual judges' ideology may have an effect and be relevant to the secularization uh, debate. 
for example, a lot of these countries are now based in the whole post-Arab Spring atmosphere and they're undergoing uh, constitutional and political transition. Uh, is the court kind of using its religious basis as a way to mediate or perhaps even neutralize the tensions that exist internally? Great question. Um, I, I think this also gets to something that Sujit was, was driving at um, really in all three of his questions um, about whether, you know, is, is the whole Islamic law regards an endogenous um, somehow what happens in cases of court packing, which, which we've seen, um, and uh, is, is there some sort of counter-majoritarian dilemma that we need to be uh, concerned with? Um, when we're looking at the court and the composition of the court um, to determine whether and how it should it should defer to what the majoritarian legislature um, passes and, and then just what are the, the emerging politics of judicial appointments. And I think um, all of these considerations are, are wrapped up neatly in your question in a way that, um, you know, has everything to do with, with how the court um, uh, approaches these cases, um, you know, one of the, the big battles about presidential, the presidential politics here in America is, is the appointments power over the Supreme Court, um, extending from a recognition that the ideology of the judges will determine or affect heavily the outcome of the cases. And so that is a, that is a, um, it's central to the question of, of how the court will interpret. And to me, that, that means that it's also important to um, step back from the question of who's on the court to looking at rules of how to interpret, um, particularly given the wild shifts in, in who's on the court. And so um, the more uh, engaged, deliberative information um, rich and transparent the interpretations are, perhaps in any system, but I'd argue these are ways of, of getting there with the presence of an Islamic law clause in this system by appealing to, to those who have more information to contribute that information in cases where Islamic law comes up in constitutional challenges um, is a way of um, not getting around the, the question of court composition, but uh, but, but recognizing and, and attempting to, uh, you know, sort of uh, respond or shape a constitutional system that is responsive to those changing realities. Uh, Christine. Um, so, uh, again, as everyone said, it was a great talk and I really appreciate it. Um, so I guess my question is about uh, Article 2, the Article 2 clause itself and its analogs in other countries. And I'm not going to ask you to predict about this, but I at least feel like there's a genuine question about whether it's going to be replicated in full in the new constitution. And there are other Muslim majority countries where, you know, as you talk about, it's the, the clause actually says Saudi so is going to be one source, a source of, of law. So I guess my question is, I, I personally would predict a kind of, um, I, would, I would predict that it, it wouldn't come out exactly replicated, especially since um, at least one iteration of the, of the Constituent Assembly had a 50-50 Islamist, non-Islamist composition. So I mean, it all kind of depends on who writes the Constitution. Mm -hmm. But um, so to me, it's interesting to ask. It seems that you know, the, the, the insertion of the word D, mm -hmm. you know, as you said in your paper, was designed to kind of convey the idea that every state law had to be in compliance with Sharia, which first of all I think is not necessarily the only interpretation of that, and second of all, you know, the suggestions that you're making seem to operate off of a continuation of, you know, the necessity of reconciling all laws with Islamic law. Um, if it turns out that a, a whatever new incarnation of Article Two isn't quite as stringent or doesn't require quite as strong of a reconciliation. You know, are, are there examples we can look at in other countries where it's a source of law? How do those tests go? You know, is, is it really going to be necessary if there's some sort of gentling of that clause to actually have the SEC um, really delve into Islamic law? And, mm -hmm. and really, and, and, and again, going to the legitimacy question, if 
we, you know, if there's now leg legitimization of Islamist parties, is there going to be a need to really kind of mute a backlash if those parties have <coughs> other venues for expressing their political ambitions? Great set of questions. Um, I think the first part of it gets at this idea of, um, you know, what do constitutions mean and constitutional clauses mean? I actually am of the opinion that the A source versus the source um, doesn't itself determine sort of the language of the Constitution, doesn't itself determine how the court goes about operating. Um, we, we, don't really have an, we don't really have a good model of this in Egypt because Egypt didn't um, actually interpret the Article II clause between 1971 and 1980 when it was changed from A source to B source. They didn't really start interpreting um, that clause until 1985. Um, but if, if other countries are any model um, for, for this question, it seems that the Sharia clauses, however they're phrased, sometimes it's the principles of Islamic law um, shall be a source and the outcomes look a lot like, or the interpretation looks a lot like it does in Egypt, or it might be uh, you know, Sharia itself or Islamic law itself. Um, is the source, and it, it still looks a lot like the Egyptian uh, court's interpretation. That seems not to be the rub. Um, by contrast, Iran, um, which has not only a Sharia clause, but where Sharia, or um, what what is purported to be um, a Sharia-based system, sort of dominates the entire constitutional scheme. Uh, where it sets up um, the supreme leader uh, with a decisive role over interpretation, over judicial appointments. Um, there's a guardian council that, that um, sort of exercises authority over the legislature and um, what, uh, what sort of legislation is actually Islamic or not Islamic to even get out of parliament and pass. Um, that seems to be at the front end um, sort of the constitutional structure um, and, and parties in place in these other bodies um, to have much more of a decisive role in determining um, the character of legislation and then the interpretation of Islamic law um, once it gets to the courts rather than the language itself. Um, so so that I think that goes to your second question as well um, about the you know, the legitimacy, the legitimacy problem. Akila. Sorry, go ahead. No. I'll, 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 I'll start. Um, I think when we're talking about um, the risk of having you know, religious parties in power, theocracy, you know, the, the kind of scenario we're, we're, many of us are afraid of, um, we're afraid of a state imposing a sort of one religion view on all its people, sort of adopting a state religion to the exclusion of minority and dissenting opinions. And in your article, and you spoke before, you seem to suggest that maybe the courts need more Islamic discussion in the courts, and this may have sort of a moderating or, or bridging effect between dissenting opinions. And I would suggest, and like to hear your opinion about your reaction to maybe the opposite is, a, is, is the risk. That more deliberation of what Islam is or should be in the court is detrimental. It only exacerbates tensions, bring religious questions, and politicize religious questions. And uh, that it's possibly not a good thing to have religion debated in court, you know, orthodoxy debated in court. Um, so. Great question, and that, that, that brings up probably the, the strongest um, you know, counter-argument to suggesting that we have more deliberation rather than less. Why, you know, if you do that, religion is a contentious issue. Won't you just um, further politicize the court, perhaps exacerbate tensions outside of the court um, with the fear of the court um, sort of rubber stamping one interpretation over another, um, and, and, and therefore leading to a lot more mayhem when the whole idea is the court is supposed to be mediating um, <coughs> some dispute before it, not creating uh, uh, more, more dispute. Um, so in part the answer is, or my answer would be that, that some of it is just the nature of the beast. Um, I, I don't think that the question of um, 
more deliberation about issues of Islamic law rather than less itself produces those effects. And the main reason why is that I'm not, the idea is not to look at, um, not to have the court um, defer to a particular interpretation, right? So I don't mean this in a Chevron-like yeah. way, Chevron-like deference way. Um, but instead, uh, to uh, you know, propose that the court in cases where um, it already has to consider Islamic law doesn't have the tools in its toolkit to do so, um, and must make, if we think of this as a technical decision um, or an area of technical competence, um, sort of get the tools in its toolkit. Um, and I would imagine that they would change over time and over court appointment changes um, such that you know, there's there's turnover, there's not any one Islamic law, which seems to be um, sort of the underlying notion motivating this fear of establishing a single state religion and state order. And then the, the final part of that is this is not to say that um, the Islamic law clauses should or do, in the Egyptian constitutional scheme at least, bind um, to the detriment of uh, non-Muslims and religious minorities um, who uh, the court very much has responsibility to interpret the Constitution with respect to the rights protecting provisions that, that guide them. Uh, my question is uh, about how the Egyptian Supreme Constitutional Court or other Islamic constitutionalist courts imagine their uh, role uh, in, in adjudicating matters of religion uh, particularly, uh, do they consciously regard themselves as peace brokers? I come from India and the parallel that I am thinking of is the Ayodhya land dispute adjudication that happened and uh, though it was not at all a religious matter, a seemingly simple property dispute because it had immense communal implications, mm -hmm. the court, at least the popular understanding of the decision was that it brokered peace, gave everybody what they wanted in order to avoid conflict. So do you think of courts as similarly brokering such deals and, or do you advocate such in instrumentalist approach at all? Mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. I think I'd have to think about that a little bit more. Um, and, and maybe that goes to, was it Akiva? Akiva. 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 Um, Akiva. 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 And you're Akiva. 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 So I think that might go to Akiva's question um, as well. Maybe this is, it's a political strategic question um, <coughs> that, that anything I'm proposing might also thrust onto the courts, that, that they also have to be careful not to privilege any one opinion if they're to, to play this um, sort of consequentialist peace, broking, peace, peace brokering role. Um, maybe that's not what they want to do and they, they want to say, you know, we operate in a political vacuum. Ours is a neutral brand of reasoning um, that has nothing to do with, with politics out there. I don't think that that's what courts actually do. Um, and, and I would imagine, you know, that the, the court would view itself as something somewhere in, in the, the realm of, of what you suggest. Um, very much seeing itself as a political animal and knowing that its decisions have consequences and looking um, with a view to what those consequences might be. So, yep, okay. This question goes to both of those questions, actually. There was an article in the Times this morning about Egypt's debating over whether or not to give all Alzheimer's power in being the final arbiter of whether or not a law conflicts with Islamic law, mm -hmm. which in some ways might address some of the concerns that are being raised here about the court's role in that and the politicization of Islamic law, but in other ways could obviously have its own consequences. So I was just wondering what you think about that proposal. I think that's a horrible idea. <laughs> um, I think that's the height of the counter-majoritarian um, problem here. Because, I mean, as her, at least in the courts you have some you know, some constitutional or conception of the, the judicial role. In Parliament, you have an elected body. In the executive, you have an elected body. Um, 
I would need to look more to see what what ways um, Azhar, the proposal is for Azhar to come in. I know there are some proposals on the table to have it um, you know, be incorporated into the Constitution as the final arbiter of what Islamic law is. Um, but yet, this is, this is a body of jurists that's both unelected and has one particular um, style of education and interpretation, and as we heard before, um, it's not representative of the varied um, groups and approaches to Islam, Islamic law um, in the country. Um, so it's, it's sort of rubber stamping one mode of interpretation, the traditionalist classical view, um, which you know, many people uh, may think that that's the correct view, but it's not the only view, and it, and it seems uh, it's non-representative and therefore um, you know, really invoking the, the counter-majoritarian problem. Okay, so I actually had a question, which is, that all the cases are about gender. I mean, what struck me as being interesting, right? Yeah. That is, they're, they're all cases about gender equality, and and the court comes down uh, on the side of gender equality, right? Consistently, um, even at the point where, um, in the, as in the FGM case, the court might have had to, you know, you, you seem to suggest that the court really didn't gave short shrift to Islamic law, right? It might have actually gone through the, the, you know, gone through the motions, but really what it did was to, to give priority to the rights protecting provisions of the Egyptian constitution. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering to what extent does the fact that there is this, there is this consistency there in the nature of the cases that bring this question up affect how the court framed and interpreted and developed this doctrine, right? And, and would it be different um, if the if the nature of the rights claim, if the nature of the claimant were different. So let me give you the counterexample, which is religious minorities, right? So, you know, the, the, all the debates in Egypt about being getting a personal ID card mm -hmm. and having your faith recorded on the personal ID card, and so the the challenges that the Ahmadi and the Baha'i would be would face as being um, not being recognized as being uh, as being Muslim and having their identity, and therefore not being able to get an ID card, and therefore facing a whole range of disabilities, legal disabilities as a consequence of that. And so the, so the question is, was that was the, if the case had been brought not on behalf of, um, not with respect to a law that advanced, that, that arguably protected the interests of Muslim women, but had been brought against a law that disadvantaged um, members of religious minority, would that, how would that have changed the trajectory of this case law? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very interesting, um, you know, thought experiment to engage in. I'm thinking of some other cases now like what? that don't involve gender, yeah. um, but th that don't actually bring up this scenario. Um, so, you know, the the 1985 case that the court um, decided, where it's the first, the very first case that it decided with respect to the Sharia clause in 1985 um, on interest. And whether um, whether the the universal classical Islamic legal rule against interest right. was um, violated by the various laws that that accepted the the capitalist um, system that very much incorporated interest and it said well this is this is sort of a um, you know a, a rule of necessity. Um, we won't uh, we won't say that interest is um, or or that what the government is doing is unconstitutional, um, and moreover, we don't want to consider any laws where that might come up. Maybe the flip scenario that you mentioned might come up. Um, there's no retroactive effect of the Sharia clause. Maybe precisely for that reason, um, it's a different regime passing these laws in the first place. Um, and we're only consider prospective applications of law. In another non-gender case, there was a landlord-tenant dispute um, that involved the sort of um, property rights and property conceptions where the court is looking at um, Islamic law to say that to privilege the tenant and the, the, the act in question or the challenge legislation was, um, was also Rights regarding with respect to the tenant, 
Um, so all, in all of these cases, what I see is gender, yes, but, but really the court def uh, paying deference to the legislative agenda. Right. Um, which was, which, you know, privileges women or the, the tenant in these cases. Um, how would that change if it were flipped? Um, yeah, that I, I don't know. I would imagine that um, if we follow this rule of deference to the legislature, um, that, that that would be the determinant for whether the court, um, how the court read the text. Okay. Stephen. I had a question I asked you, you really asked you, so let me just add. Um, <laughs> That's always great. I mean, to, to the extent it was the case, as I understand it, that uh, the authority and executive get greater judicial review power in part to give some outlook for Islamic uh, thought, even though ultimately it, it's served economic interest, but there was some sense in which it was an attempt to sort of create a space for Islamic thinking, like in, in terms of um, uh, uh, economic matters. Um, then might one expect it to flip once one now has, uh, in, in an avowedly secular regime, so this was to some extent created as an outlet for uh, uh, to sort of uh, uh, Islamic uh, concerns about secularism, might one expect it to flip now that we have at least to accept an Islamist regime, might one expect it to flip, and again, you could, I mean the secularization thesis seems a bit of a red herring, right, I mean I think it's extreme to the extent that Herschel argues that uh, one would expect no engagement whatsoever with Islamic sources uh, in the Constitution, which has Article 2. Um, if that is his view, that, that seems kind of unlikely. Um, the, the question... Well, maybe you know, not this, no engagement, yeah. but just yeah. um, privileging the liberal class right. always. Right, right. But, I mean, secular in the sense of not taking, uh, not engaging in any Seriously. kind of serious yeah, way uh, with religion. Uh, you know, as Calypso says, given the incredible contestation in Islamic law, which is most fundamentally about which version of uh, Islamic law is going to prevail, mm -hmm. right? The fundamentalist Wahhabi, Saudi-style fundamentalist uh, Islam, or more moderate Islam, right, that's been uh, uh, by many political reformers in, in the Islamic world. I mean, that's the, the crucial issue. To the extent one could see these results as, as promoting a, a kind of more liberal uh, version uh, of uh, Islamism. One, one question is how much popular support will that have to the extent that they are, you know, not secularizing but a moderating force for the harsh Islam, which, as you said, the outset is the fear that everybody has. To what extent will, will there be popular support uh, for that um, uh, going forward um, before the court? And because again, to other questions that people ask. Great. Uh, so. To your first point, um, I actually, I, I think that we, it would be interesting to consider this this idea of whether we should expect um, the concerns motivating the incorporation of Islamic law, whether we should expect that whole equation to flip um, now that the regimes are different, right? And the, and um, the claimants will change too. Right? And the claimants will right? change. Right, I mean, it'll, it'll be secular litigants, right? Right, or saying that the saying laws are not sufficiently Islamic. Right or or, to, or 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 not sufficiently rights protecting, right? That right, they, right, right, right. Um, and but I think they may flip for different. I think they may flip, but for different reasons. So, uh, you know, I don't think that the idea before was that Islamic law was in place to give at least some space to Islamic thinking, but rather to control what the uh, to control both the legislative agenda um, and. Uh, and, and sort of what the Islamic law um, definition was in the courts. Of course, the regime lost control of the courts on the Islamic law question, and they couldn't sort of dictate or predict how the court would come down. But I think the motivating factor was, you know, we want to co incorporate um, to co-opt um, the whole question of Islamic law as a way of consuming um, more religious legitimacy into the executive. Um, but now I, th I think it's right that um, you know here you have a whole you know what looks like an, an Islamist regime through and through on every level except maybe the courts um, and so yeah it seems then you would get a flip with um, a legislative agenda coming out um, and then being challenged um, with the claimants um, arguing that it's it's insufficiently 
rights protecting? And that'll be the really interesting um, question to see unfold, or set of debates to see unfold as to how the court then uh, then interprets those texts. And to your second question about the um, you know sort of the popular support for the court, um, does it have a moderating effect rather than you know, secularizing one if we want to characterize it in that way? I think that goes to, to your first question um, or, or comment as well in that, um, and relates to, was it uh, Richard Phillips over here? Yeah. His, his intervention about just sort of how much reservoir does the court have as an independent judicial body whose decisions are respected? Um, to the extent that that reservoir is deep, then I would expect um, a moderating role for the court on one side or another in terms of um, privileging the new rights claimants who are coming to the court. Um, the same way that it, that it regards the, uh, the claimants on the other side um, to issue decisions and have those decisions be respected. Um, I think the, the depth of the reservoir will, will sort of dictate that. And I think it's, it's uh, sufficiently deep. So, so I was wondering if I could take in the, in the direction as we kind of wrap up a prognostication of it. You know, I know you want to you predict, but so you it's know. That I don't want to. I, just, I can't. I know. I that's fine. Look, it's a dangerous game right now to predict anything, right? So, so we talked about. Um, so Rick Pilders and others have talked about capturing the court, right? So there's obviously now politics of judicial appointment. The court has set up kind of barricades around the appointing power, and it's not clear what's going to happen, mm -hmm. right? We don't know. So, and, and so the, the focus of that type of politics has been on um, the appointing power, mm -hmm. right? There also might be a politics around the composition or membership of the court. So we talked about, you know, what the institutional relationship is of Al-Hazar to the court, right? Mm -hmm. Would there be a chamber that's developed within the court to deal with Article Two cases? Who knows, right? There's all sorts of different models. The other, there's, uh, there's two other kind of institutional design issues that I, that I would sort of like to get your your thoughts on. The first is the notion of judicial supremacy. And so I'm looking at Stephen Gardbaum here, who's written a lot about the Commonwealth model of constitutionalism, and, and the, the basic intuition is, is that there's a whole range of constitutional systems where uh, the court doesn't have the final word, at least to the same degree that, the, that, is the, that we associate with not just the American system of judicial review, but the constitutional court model um, internationally, right? That mm -hmm. there, there, there's our, there, there are ways to institutionalize um, a role for the legislature to override the decision of the court through supermajorities or through clear statement legislation or, I mean, there's a whole family of, of institutional responses. So to what extent is that part of the agenda or discussion right now? I guess the second issue is um, to what extent, so what is the nature of the jurisdiction of the court, right? The, the court exists in, a, in the context of a civilian style uh, legal system, right, where you have many parallel courts. Um, and including the Supreme Administrative Court, right, which are a lot, where a lot of the important cases mm -hmm. after the transition have been playing out, right, both on, you know, the the, the banning of the N, of the NDP, but also on uh, the the Constitutional Assembly cases have largely been fought out in the Administrative Court, right, mm -hmm. not in the not before the SEC. So, to what extent will the the way in which the court, so to what extent is the court's jurisdiction, the SEC's jurisdiction, at play, right? Because one way in which to respond to it is by curbing its jurisdiction. You know? I, I know I read that there was a proposal afoot after the dissolution decision uh, to basically um, withdraw from the court the power to dissolve parliament uh, in the face of a law that, uh, that created, in fact, an unconstitutional or illegally constituted parliament. Right? Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering to what extent those issues are on the table. Great um, ending questions. The, the first about uh, whether, to what extent the idea of judicial supremacy rather than legislative or some other type of supremacy is at play. I think it's, uh, or motivating this discussion, I think it's very much at play. Um, there's nothing to say that Egypt actually is a regime where judicial supremacy is the name of the game, mm -hmm. um, rather than, um, although there aren't formal mechanisms in place uh, for uh, processes of judicial override, uh, similar to the the American model, uh, legislative overrides have happened there, um, and there's nothing to say that they can't happen um, again by uh, taking uh, a case that or or 
um, a law that the court has determined was unconstitutional, modifying it, modifying it slightly, but essentially maintaining, <coughs> you know, sort of the crux of what the legislator was, legislature was getting at in the first place, and and moving with that. And it's actually because of that um, that that institutional relationship that questions of the court's interpretation of Islamic law become especially important. Right. Sort of the processes of how it engages in that become important because if there's a perception, while backlash might not be um, the big fear, if there's a perception even in the legislature that the court didn't take the Islamic law question seriously, um, maybe the, mm. not the popular backlash, but the legislative override mm. um, threat would come into play mm. um, where the, the legislature you know, has fire for reaffirming and, and reissuing um, very similar legislation to the one that the court invalidates. Um, and, and so the, the process or procedures of the court um, going through interpretations of Islamic law I think to the extent that they're perceived as more legitimate, having mm. taken into account uh, the entire panoply of Islamic law, rights protecting clauses would lessen the impetus of a legislature um, sort of overriding on the basis that the, the decision was illegitimately constituted or, or, or issued. Um, the nature of jurisdiction, I don't know that the SEC has um, that the SEC is special in this regard. The, S, the SAC, the Supreme Administrative Court, mm. you're right, has been deciding a lot of these interim decisions after the spring. Yeah, so these political, very political cases. Very political cases. Yeah. Um, is the dissolution of parliament legitimate? Um, sometimes the SAC, the Administrative Court, declines review mm -hmm. and says, you know, the SCC, the Constitutional Court, should decide this. Mm -hmm. But uh, to the, in the way that these courts have been working, at least um, in recent months, and in fact, the FGM case was a SAC court mm -hmm. case, the, um, the administrative court case. I think it's more about the judiciary rather than mm -hmm. the Supreme Constitutional Court itself, mm -hmm. particularly mm -hmm. since they seem to share jurisdiction over, mm -hmm. or assume jurisdiction over, um, highly politicized cases, whether they're politicized because they're about um, the constitution of, of the various branches that are now in contestation, or politicized because they involve religion and Islamic law. I think both of them sort of assume a certain type of um, jurisdiction over both of these questions. Mm -hmm. um, and and to, to overcome that, it wouldn't be to take some mm -hmm. um, of the jurisdiction away from the SCC, mm -hmm. but to diminish the, the power of judicial review itself. Mm -hmm. Well, on that note, please join me in thanking Professor Rob.